This is our next to last section of notes for, for the year. Um, this is a brief overview of the 70s and the 80s. There are some things that are going to be covered a little bit in the next section with some of the trends. We did also have some of the things with the, the fact of the um, Vietnam War as well as civil rights um, that were included in other, other sections. So now we're going to focus a little bit more on on the, the side. Um, now there's, there's a lot of state standards but not as many directly with this. There's going to be a few things that you're going to see that we do have to do. For our bracketing dates, none of them in the 1970s directly. This is where we're going to look at the 70s and one thing I do want you to do when we're having for the 70s and then when we get the 80s section, a lot of times we look at things and today we look, look at the 70s as man what a horrible decade and the 80s were so good. So our overall theme that we get to, to kind of look at is were the 70s actually all that bad and were the 80s that, that great um, here that you have. Alright, for, for President Nixon, we went over a lot of things that, that he had had and his, the fact of Vietnam, uh, that we had some of the things with the civil rights in the, in the past um, there, but here we're going to look for government. After a huge growth of government with the New Deal, the World War II, and then we have the Great Society programs. Nixon's not one to say, let's reverse this and, and go back to the way it was. But there was some of the things that he had, and this is where in government you go deeper into the idea of new federalism. The best example of this will be the for Medicaid. Medicaid will be used re revenue sharing. The idea of revenue sharing is that the federal government's going to provide a base for, for the states. The states then can build off of it, and there's a minimum that the states must do with Medicaid. Uh, another thing that will come about it, uh, more so in the future, but the idea of stars in Nixon presidency is block grants, where there aren't as many strings attached, and so the local and state governments can use this. Um, again, he, Nixon was a shrewd politician and very pragmatic. I use that word a lot uh, about about Nixon, which means practical. He knows that he can't go and and reverse things, but let's slow things down. Politically, he, he um, realized that in the 1968 election, George Wallace had won multiple states as a third party. One of the few times there that um, it's basically an extension of the Dixiecrats, but the American Independent Party will win a couple deep south states. Now, Nixon is not going to go and, and go to the extreme of saying, let's reverse segregation or reverse integration, go back to segregation. But what he does is what a lot of times we call dog whistles, and he says we need to slow down, especially things like forced busing um, that we have. He will also nominate more conservatives to the Supreme Court, and in 1972, the Deep South will vote Republican, and they will continue to vote Republican from that point on until basically our recent election um, here. Usually the only time that the Democrats can win electoral votes in the Deep South well, when they have a, a homegrown um, person like Jimmy Carter from Georgia or Bill Clinton from Arkansas. Now you might think here, well, Florida, we're deep south. We are geographically, but we're more like Ohio in the demographics that we have than we are Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi. All right, the Burger Court. There are a couple different cases that you do need to be familiar with after the Warren Court um, ends. Chief um, Burger will, will be the one that'll happen. First of all, Swan versus Mecklenburg. Um, where I mentioned the busing, this is where this case will uphold if school systems were to do, do a busing. One of the problems that they had for trying to eliminate segregation was school systems would just say that they're doing neighborhood schools and they pretty much would draw the lines where it was still almost completely segregated on there. So that the Swan case will uphold the idea of Brown of trying to have integration come about. Furman versus Georgia. Now, Furman versus Georgia is an Eighth Amendment um, case, but it's also actually more of a Fourteenth Amendment case. What will be done in Furman versus Georgia is they will say capital punishment or the death penalty will be stopped as it was then. Um, there. Now, they did not say because death penalty was cruel and unusual. What they said is the way that it was being applied, because in the Deep South, in particular. If a black man was to have the same crime as a white man, the black man was more likely to have, have get, get, be um, sentenced to the death penalty than the white man. So that is why they will tell every state to redo their laws. See, Dre versus Georgia 1976 will be the first time that a state will be allowed to use it again. Although Florida, we will defer, be the first to, to um, go and use electrification. Um, 
Yeah. Florida, our laws stay for a death penalty that if you are sentenced to death, your case is automatically sent to the Supreme Florida Supreme Court for review. And the Florida Supreme Court will look to see, is there anything that has to do with race, gender, or color, um, that idea, that habit. They won't say you're innocent, but they can move it from a death penalty to life imprisonment without parole. Roe versus Wade, 1973, this will be the court case that says that a woman's right to privacy under the Fourth Amendment gives her a right to an abortion. Now, we'll go deeper into this in a class where the case will divide up the pregnancy into three different trimesters. And what it will say is that states can't outlaw in the, third tri in the first trimester. Uh, it will say that they can do it in the third trimester, which every state has except for um, the case of the, the mother's life being endangered. One of the biggest differences and changes over time will be the second trimester. Think about if a child in 1973 was born three months premature, what was the likelihood of them living compared to today? So that's why that third trimester. Also, future cases that we'll have will say that as long as it doesn't do an undue burden on the mother, that there can be some restrictions made, such as a waiting period, which a waiting period is where for a woman that wants to have an abortion, that she goes to a doctor, she has to wait 72 hours or something before she can have it, and in that time it gives a chance for her to be told other options like adoptions and that. So that's why and that we have had changes over time since that. All right, if Nixon was known just for foreign policy and we didn't have Watergate, he would probably be seen as one of our, our best presidents. Um, now one thing that we have, the first part of the Nixon Doctrine, he is one that he's going to deal on power. He's not. He's basically for a smaller country. He'll listen to you, but you better do what they say. He's only going to negotiate with larger countries. Henry Kissinger, the man that's on the, the upper right there, he will be um, the main advisor as sometimes during history. He'll be even our Secretary of State. He'll be an advisor to Nixon, Ford, Carter, Bush. Uh, uh, now, one word that you do need to know for Nixon uh, is detente, and this is where the Cold War, the tensions started to ease. Um, Nixon's going to be famous for being the first president to visit China and the first president to visit the Soviet Union, and we start talking. Um, this is started by ping pong diplomacy, and not making it up. This is where, when you see the movie Forrest Gump, where Forrest goes to play ping pong, that is where we have some ping pong players go over, and for the first time in decades, we actually are doing something with the, the um, Chinese um, that are communists um, there. Now, Nixon was very, very practical or pragmatic also. He will realize that, yes, China and Soviet Union are both communists, but they actually are not the same type, and he'll work them against each other. Um, we will end up having it where China, communist China, a red China is added to the UN, and this again will be some of the some of the easing of the Cold War tensions that will then continue on over the next presidents. Even though we look at Vietnamization and it ultimately failed, Nixon is given credit because he did get us out of Vietnam, and so that's where we have it. And with the last helicopter in the fall of Saigon that did not happen under President Nixon, it will be later on under President Ford in there, so he will get us out. We will start uh, limitations of military. Instead of building up, building up, the SALT or the Strategic Arms Limitation Talks, and then we'll become treaties, <coughs> will be started by Nixon, continued by Ford and Carter later on. So we will try to limit things. And this is where, for Nixon, if we, if we were to just look at things, I mean, even as critics, um, we'll have to look and see that he had a lot of things, especially with detente that he had, that he does increase um, the, the, the likelihood of world peace. And, and it will cool down things for the, the Great Depression. The 1976, 1972 election will pit the most liberal candidate that the Democrats ever put in George McGovern. And one thing it shows is that Americans, we do not like extremes, whether they're liberal or conservative. You notice on that map that only the state of Massachusetts and, and um, D um, D.C. vote in favor of McGovern. In 1964, when the Republicans will put their most conservative candidate in Goldwater, um, there will be a landslide that is made by the Democrats there. And Americans usually don't want um, the, the extremes um, they have. But when you look at that map, and we look at things, and in 1972, Americans were really in, in vast approval of what was happening under Richard Nixon uh, there. But soon after ele the election, something's going to happen uh, there, which at the time doesn't seem very significant, but it will play into a lot of later politics. 
his vice president, Spiro Agnew, will have to resign under bribery and tax evasion charges. According to the 25th Amendment that was passed not too long before that, if, the, if there is no vice president, the president can appoint someone, has to be approved by the Senate. Um, it doesn't seem like that big of a deal um, at the time, but Gerald Ford, who is the most pretty likable guy that's a representative from Michigan, becomes the vice president. Um, again, it doesn't seem like a big deal at that time. During the 72 elections, we will have the journalists Woodward and Carl Bernstein that will be, in, that will be using, basically doing the police beat, and they will notice that the breaking into a, some offices seemed a little bit odd. It didn't seem to be, be by for money or something of real, real value. It's the Democratic National offices that are part of the Watergate Hotel complex. And so they start investigating and say, why did these five men that really don't have a criminal record why did they break in? And as they go deeper and deeper into they realize that some of these, and the nickname of it, plumbers, um, were part of what is called CREEP. Yeah, they were not very good um, at their acronyms in the 1970s, but CREEP, the Committee to Re-Elect the President. Now, if we were to stop right now and say that Nixon would, at this moment, go and say, yes, they were working on that campaign, I don't even know them, all right, they just need to be punished. He would have had a few days of bad press and that the issue would have got basically been swept away. The problem is, is that's not what happens. As more and more information comes about, Nixon will do more and more things that will be looking like he's covering things up. He will fire investigators and what's called Saturday Night Massacre on there that are, are working on it. And then as investigations go more into they find out that since the Pentagon Papers, Nixon had been tape recording his home conversations. So they want to find out, was he, was he actually doing, did he actually have any involvement in it? And where they have this secret person that's given them information by the nickname of Deep Throat um, there. They, they, they know some certain times. Um, Nixon tries to release the transcripts, but that's not enough. He says he's not going to release the tapes. The House of Representatives, they, they um, sue him, so the United States sues Nixon. Nixon claims he has executive privilege, which presidents love to use that to try to get away with things um, there. But the Supreme Court, in the case U.S. versus Nixon, says, no, you must release the tapes. When he releases the tapes, there are gaps in it. Notice the political cartoon with the little, little hat gap on the side of the paper uh, are the tapes that you have. Ultimately then, this is where the cover-up is going to, uh, to undo Nixon's presidency, that there's a committee that, in the House of Representatives that is going to vote in favor of impeachment. It is then going to be sent to the entire floor. The floor of the House would have voted for impeachment before they can. Nixon resigns. Okay? And this is where we are in August of 1974. He resigns. Gerald Ford becomes president. Gerald Ford gives the, the inaugural address of our long national nightmare is over, and he soon then gives, gives Nixon a full pardon. Now, what it, that was not Ford's in the original intention. The problem was nothing could get done because we were still fighting about Watergate in the time after that. So he gives Nixon the pardon so we can get on with things. It will hurt Gerald Ford politically. He will lose the next election, and the main reason is, is people that are suggesting that that he did something improper. But this is where we seem to sometimes have the right person in office. Gerald Ford seemed to be a very good, kind soul um, and helped heal a lot of the wounds of Watergate. And, and we later on in history look back and it has seemed like that was the right decision that Gerald Ford will, will make. Now, the deeper effects is after Vietnam and after Watergate, the American people don't trust the, the government very much. We will have a decrease of that. The view of the presidency changes, where it used to be like, like with I mean the press ignoring the fact of of JFK having having affairs with very famous women um, there, but they would ignore. They're not going to anymore. And anything the president has, I mean, even Gerald Ford, who's actually very athletic as a former football player for University of Michigan, um, when he would slip. Um, sometimes falling down the down the, the the stairs to Air Force One, and Saturday Night Live will go and make fun fun of this. And this is where, from the point on, after Watergate um, and after Vietnam, yes, your government is um, being held accountable and being made fun of. There, this cartoon actually says a lot for Richard Nixon. So you see the left side of it. There's Richard Nixon with the olive branch, China. He's stepping over the China, the the Great Wall of China. 
so and the greatness of foreign policy. But he's actually getting hung because of the other side with Watergate. And you see the tape that's, that, that's there that's hanging him and him stepping over the Constitution. And that is where the problem that, that Nixon has is his legacy. And actually, even domestically, um, he did slow down a lot of the issues, but even for environment, where he was the president that signed the Clean Air Act and Clean Water Act that we had earlier uh, there. So he, he definitely was one that probably would have been seen as, as a very good, maybe even a great president, if it wasn't for the fact of Watergate. All right, one of the biggest themes for the 1970s starts with Nixon and will continue on. It'll actually go until the very first, second year of, of Ronald Reagan in the 1980s. But stagflation, it combines the two things that we don't want to happen with the economy. We don't want to have high inflation. We don't want to have high employment um, in there. And that's what ends up happening during the 1970s. Nixon tries to have government control that will end up failing because if you freeze prices and wages for six, six months or something, when the freeze comes out, people make up for it. Plus, they think you might do it again. They might do it. It actually makes the problem worse. A bigger problem we had in the 70s, though, was, was the fact that we, had, we were basically very behind. Remember, most of our factories were built in the 40s and the 50s. Now in the 60s and the 70s, our factories are old and we need to update them. And we will do a lot of that in the 70s and the early 80s, which will help us in the 80s. It's kind of like some that we've been going through the last decade as a lot of companies have to modernize. One thing, and I have a little bit in the notes here, but I show a couple different videos on there. The, the energy crisis was a major, major thing in the 70s. And there's, again, even though there's not much no notes, uh, it starts out when the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, OPEC, uh, they will raise the price and it'll dramatically change the price of gas uh, there. The price of gas will, will go up uh, to over a dollar. Now you may say, that's not that much. Well, you got to realize that gas was 30, 40 cents and then within a few years it was over a dollar. It would be much like today where gas is right now about 280, 290 if gas was to suddenly become $9 a gallon. Okay. And there was even a very short time when some refineries um, were down and things like that, the gas went up to $4 a gallon, which would be equal today to over $15 a gallon um, there. And this is something that's going to keep going and at different times. And, and it's going to be something that hurt both from Nixon, Ford, and especially Jimmy Carter later on. All right, got to get ready for the mid-70s. So make sure you got your polyester and your bell bottoms. Not everything is bad. 1976 was a huge year for America. It's our 200th birthday. And you think we're coming up on the 250th birthday. So some of you entrepreneurs think, what can I do if I buy a bunch of red, white, and blue things and that kind of stuff for celebrating it? But the bicentennial celebration of 1976 was a, was a major thing in, a, in a American history. This is where the huge fireworks show, and this is where Forrest Gump or Forrest and Jenny are going to be watching that on that day. The 76th election, um, Gerald Ford was having a major problem still because he's being connected with Watergate and a lot of people are thinking there's some sort of deal with the pardon on there. Jimmy Carter is a complete outsider. Um, he's seen as this down-to-earth peanut farmer. Now, his family did own an agribusiness, but it's not your little peanut farm. In fact, Jimmy Carter went to the Naval Academy, was a nuclear engineer with a nuclear sub program. So, very highly educated on there. He comes back and runs the business, but he does go and he's a one-term governor of Georgia. Um, and this is where we, after Watergate, after Vietnam, we want someone that has not been intertwined with everything in DC. So this is where he's an outsider. And we're gonna have Ronald Reagan after that is seen as an outsider. Now Carter, one of the biggest things he's going to do is make what he calls a misery index running against Gerald Ford. The idea, are you better off than when he became president? It's pretty much using the numbers from, from inflation and unemployment, which is a stagflation in there with his misery index. Unfortunately for Carter, this is going to come back to haunt him because inflation and unemployment are going to get worse during his presidency, and in 1980, Ronald Reagan will use this against him. Now, Jimmy Carter, when you do your interviews, you will find a lot of people will, will, list, will list him as one of the best leaders um, in America. Usually, if they're looking at a person in the moral grounds, he may be our most moral president. I mean, he said that he would not lie to the American people, but that didn't really work real good in um, as a president. Meanwhile, 
uh, there, some, you'll probably have twice as many people list him as one of our worst leaders in the fact that most of the things when you think of his presidency usually have a negative aspect from foreign policy to, to the energy crisis um, and domestically in there. There are some good things, and this is where Jimmy Carter, who is truly, again, a, a very good man, he wanted to base things on human rights. He will continue on with the SALT treaties and re trying to reduce nuclear weapons. He's going to be most famous for his Camp David, David Accords. After three decades of fighting, he will have the Egypt, Egypt and Israel come together, sign a peace treaty. Every president since that time has hoped to have their Camp David Accords because after three decades of fighting, Egypt and Israel have not fought since this time. Where we've had other presidents sign different things, but normally in the Middle East, it ends up with it still fighting. So this is where the Camp David Accords are, are one of the shining moments um, that he has. But there are a lot of negatives that are occurring in, in his four years as president. He has got, there's going to be a huge backlash when he signs a treaty that was going to give the Panama Canal back to the country of Panama in the year 2000. A lot of people said he was weak on military um, there. He's going to make it where our Navy wasn't able to do things. Um, that, that aspect probably isn't too true, seeing that he um, graduated from the Naval Academy and realized that our aircraft carriers and subs would never go through the Panama Canal. Um, and so strategically, it was not as important. Plus, by the time it went to him in 2000, we're giving them a canal that was um, almost a century old, which since that time, they have been building a new, deeper canal on uh, there. Three Mile Island was uh, the worst case that we will have and the closest that we'll come to a huge nuclear accident. And this is where, again, we were fortunate that the one president that we have that, that is highly educated in nuclear education will be the president sitting when we have this accident. So when experts called him, he could actually talk to him directly and not try to find out from scientists who does he trust and who it is that he could talk to him directly and ask questions about what needs to be done um, here. One long-term effect that you'll notice, after 1979, we will not begin construction on a nuclear plant after that time um, there. We had some that were being built and will be finished, but we're not going to start new ones. Also environmentally, this is where we're going to have Love Canal, which was a community that everyone had to leave because pretty much it was on a toxic waste dump. But one of the worst things that we'll see in American history, and you see this picture over on the right, is the fact that we will have, um, after the Iranian uh, Revolution, the Ayatollah community will have followers that go into the U.S. Embassy and will take 52 American hostages. And for the next 444 days, these were the images that we saw of Americans that were blindfolded and taken one place for another. Carter does try to send a rescue mission, but our military is not prepared at that time to fight in the desert. As a, so we, we will end up having a crash um, there. And presidents, again, give too much credit um, and too much blame. Was the crash uh, Carter's fault? No. Just like it was, like Bin Laden being killed wasn't because of of um, President Obama, but this is where even for things like that. Um, the, the, the hostage will not be released until after Reagan had been um, inaugurated. This is where um, a lot of things point to that the supporters wanted to make sure that Carter was shamed for helping of the, of the um, peace treaty between Israel and Egypt. The 1980 Summer Olympics, again, Carter's basing things on human rights. The, Uni the, the Soviet Union will invade Afghanistan. We say that it's wrong, so we won't go to the 1998 or 1980 Olympic Games. Uh, today, we kind of look at that and say that maybe that's not the best way to basically punish our athletes for it. Um, we're right now we're in a debate whether or not to go to the 2022 um, Winter Olympics in China for human rights uh, there. So we may say history repeat itself in that way. But that is where we don't participate in those games. 1984, the Soviets will use our attack on Grenada and other things that we have as a reason not to go to the 84 Olympics in Los Angeles. Either way, it doesn't really help because the home country ends up winning um, more medals in there. The economy, long story short, just keeps getting worse and worse under um, Carter. We're going to have interest rates getting too, too high. Inflation is going to be up to 40%. Uh, 14% in 1980. Unemployment just keeps going. The gas lines are something that people are having to go and it gets worse and worse. Jimmy Carter gives a speech, the Maylee speech that he has, which if we listen to it today, you're saying, you notice he's saying a whole lot of wise things about how we need to use renewable sources, not be so dependent on foreign oil. But we don't want our president telling us that. We want the president to fix the problem um, there, not tell us to 
All right, turn our air conditioner where it, we don't use quite, quite as much electricity. So that is where it will be something that, yeah, it, he may have known, known what should be done, but it wasn't getting done. Um, we talked about before about Vietnam and the Watergate and the distrust that we have. You see here up until the kind of Kennedy's assassination, it goes down. We do have a little spike up during the 90s up to 9-11, but overall you see we go from three out of four people trusting the government to less than one out of four that we have. All right, so Carter's presidency will end in 1980 election. Um, that misery index that he did in 76 is going to use against him because we'll become more miserable. Ronald Reagan is another outsider. Um, he's a B-list actor. I mean, he wasn't someone famous like a Tom Hanks or a Tom Cruise, but he's one that if you were a person that watched movies, you're like, I recognize him. People that were deep into movies definitely knew who he was. But he had never been in Washington, D.C. as a representative senator or anything like that. So he's another outsider. But as an actor, he knew how to, to talk to the people and was nicknamed the great communicator. Um, he will win a, huge re or run, win, a, win a huge election landslide. Jimmy Carter, you can see, where it's kind of seen after a four-year election as a referendum on what do you think of the president. Most Americans did not want Jimmy Carter as president anymore. Now, the basis of Reagan will be the Reaganomics. There's three parts that you need to know. First are there's going to be budget cuts to social programs, which we're going to see the effects of some of these in the future. Some of the things like rising crime and homelessness will go in the 80s on there. We're going to have in the 90s and the 2000s things with mental health um, that you have. Second thing was for the economics, we will have trickle-down economics or supply-side economics. The ideas of cutting taxes to the rich and the corporations, and the idea that then they will invest more in the economy and get the economy going. For, for like what happened under John F. Kennedy, it works. And, 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 and by 1983, the economy is going um, good. And this is where it's a time in history, where there's times in history you can look at supply-side, say it didn't work, this is one of the times that it did work. Meanwhile, there will be a huge increase in military spending. We will have the program nicknamed Star Wars, but officially called Strategic Defensive uh, Initiative. In this, this is where Reagan one time was giving a speech about how we're getting, we have a group of lasers and missiles, and we'll shoot down a missile that the Soviets send. When he gets off the stage, his advisors asked him, Mr. President, what are you speaking of? And he told him, I dreamt it. And... Since that time, we have, we have a lot of pieces of that. But the Soviets thought we, that for him to talk about it, we must actually have that technology. And it's one of the things that helped to end the Cold War because they tried to spend so much to catch up. And they were in a race that they thought we were about to finish and we hadn't even started it. And, but it will end up doing things and bankrupting the Soviet Union. So the effects of this, the Cold War is ultimately one. The economy is going to improve, but our national debt's going to climb. Um, here now you might laugh at the numbers when you see it today but this is where we're back in the 80s we were worried about a national debt going over a trillion dollars um, there so which in your lifetime every presidency has added more to national debt than the last one Reagan is going to be the first of two Teflon presidents Bill Clinton being the other the Teflon presidents are the ones that no matter what happened nothing bad seemed to stick to them um, there, whether it be things in politics or our own personal life. And this kind of shows, once again, that Americans, our number one issue is economics, no matter what we say. This political cartoon is a great, great one showing of things with the, with the Reaganomics. And you see Ronald Reagan in the front, tax cuts where he's mowing the yard. Look, dear, while we slept, that nice man went and prettied up the front yard. But Reagan says, wait till you see the backyard. And you see the deficits and the adding to the national debt. You see all the different missiles as the military is going. But the 1980s seemed really great. Our economy keeps improving after the very first part, 83, 84, and it will go great until 1991. Militarily, we're going to, to have an invasion on Grenada. You might say, Grenada, what's that? Well, it's a tiny country in the Caribbean. All right, think sports-wise, if you've lost a lot of games and there, sometimes you just want to have somebody easy to beat up on on here. So that's what Grenada was. And it made us feel good and got a little bit of the taste of Vietnam and the Iran hostage air out. Reagan during the 80s will do, and this is where he doesn't give enough credit but, um, a lot of times, but um, Gorbachev, the leader of the Soviet Union, and the two of them together, they will a lot of times get away from a lot of the advisors and say, and use a lot of common sense that we have. And, and this is where the idea of ending the Cold War and where Reagan is seen 
as the, as the president that ended the Cold War. We're going to have things like for women's rights. Sandra Day O'Connor will be the first woman um, to be on the Supreme Court. Sally Ride will be the first woman astronaut. Geraldine Ferraro in 1984 will be the first woman on a major party candidate. But you notice that 84 election, yes, Americans are loving Reagan. Okay, he wins the election. Electorally, it was a very close 525 to 13. Okay, so yes, Americans were loving Ronald Reagan in 84. Now, what's not being realized with this? First of all, we have a lot of things that are coming about. Crime and homelessness um, that we have that are increasing. Even though the economy is good for most, there's a part that's being left behind. One thing that we find in the 80s, and this continues even today, more and more corporations and factories that are locating overseas. They find it's cheaper to produce over there. So American jobs are being lost in there. But one of the biggest things in the 1980s will be for AIDS. Um, acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome, um, HIV, AIDS, you, in, interchangeably um, that you can use with this um, and here for, for the history side of this. And here, in the early 80s, we, this mysteriously um, appears and we have people that are dying and can't figure out what they are, are dying from. And most Americans and including the Reagan administration really doesn't do anything about it. The first group that's affected mightily from it will be homosexual men. The second group will be drug users. And so that's why for a lot of Americans, they kind of didn't bother them, they looked at it and it just um, ignored it. But then we will have, when it starts hitting more, more and more people, and especially when it starts hitting more heterosexuals, here in Florida we have a case of two children that, that die from a blood transfusion down in Bradenton, a, a teenage girl that dies down in South Florida after a dentist um, visit, and realizing then that the impact that AIDS can have. Um, and so it won't be until later in the 80s that, that it is something that the government will take more of a stance on um, here after thousands of people die. Now, what was the effect on the sexual revolution? So you remember the sexual revolution back in the 60s? The idea is that basically you can do with what you want with who you want no matter what um, in here and that kind of grows in the 70s. Well, that comes to a screeching halt because the idea that you can do what you want, well, maybe not because the idea that, I mean, if you're having sex with a person, you're having sex with everybody else that they have. So it's, I'm not saying that teenagers and people in their 20s stopped having sex um, outside of marriage or anything like that. But there was a lot more being careful um, and there, maybe a little bit more getting to know your partner um, there. And that will continue on until we get to the 2000s. And now, and I'll have a graph in a little bit that will kind of show um, in here that the death, once the death rate goes down from AIDS, and then people aren't quite as careful again when we start having more of the hookup culture idea of the 2000s. All right, a savings and loan crisis. Um, one thing for Ronald Reagan, he believed that government was the problem, not the solution, and he will have a lot of deregulation. Some of these rules and some of these regulations taken away will make it where we were going to have a banking crisis, which is going to cause a recession in 1991. Reagan's not going to be blamed for it. Again, this is where he's a Teflon president. Uh, Bush is going to be blamed for it. He will end up losing the 92 election uh, be, because of this. All right, here's a chart that I was telling you if you look at it and notice that it affects men a lot more than women um, in here. And you see here, by the time we get to the 1990s with in there, but this is where we have some drugs and that we are able to go and lessen the effects of HIV. And so a lot less people are, are dying from it um, here. And so, this is where you kind of see that change and then what ends up happening in the 2000s uh, there. For foreign affairs, we're going to have a lot of problems in Latin America. This is where some of this will be created from the United States, from where we had a lot of narco states um, there for the United States for our drug problem that we have. But we also have conflicts with for areas, whether they're going to be communist or whether they're going to be um, democratic. And obviously we're going to support the Democratic side, no matter what, in many cases. One thing that a lot of people don't realize is terrorism started long before 9-11. In fact, actually in these 60s, 70s, and the 80s, it was quite prevalent in other parts of the world. We had some domestic terrorism during the 60s and early 70s. During the 80s, we will be affected by terrorists. We will have terrorists um, that kill 241 Marines in Beirut. We will have um, people that are on planes that are... That are brought down by terrorists. One example of this will be the Lockerbie bombers, which we, with, when we find out that Libya was a part of this, um, President, President Reagan will authorize a uh, bombing of Libya 
in reaction to their, to their helping terrorists. Uh, 1989, it will actually be President Bush, but we will go down, send the troops down to Panama and capture Manuel Noriega, who has, had basically was being an authoritarian government and using, using a, as um, Nicaragua as a, a um, narco state. Now, one thing that happens in the Reagan administration will be the Iran-Contra scandal. In this case, we're going to have two illegal things happen by our government. First, we're going to have part of our government sell weapons to Iran, which you might remember that whole hostage thing, we're not friendly with Iran. They will use the weapons that they sell illegally to Iran to illegally buy more weapons that they will then sell to the Contras, which is a terrorist group in Nicaragua. Now, in Nicaragua, this is where we had the fighting of the Sandinistas, and um, the Sandinistas were communists. So we're going to support terrorists because they're anti-communists. So even though we say we, we aren't going to support terrorists, well, if they're anti-communists, we will um, in here. During this time period, even when there's papers of things that, that Reagan has, uh, that he signed on off on, on some of these operations, he's not blamed for it. Um, now you have to realize also for some of this, a lot of Americans were realizing at that time that he was slipping mentally. So he may have, when he said he didn't remember signing it, he may have truly not remembered signing the papers, or it's just a batch of papers that, that, he, that he had. In the 1980s, uh, there, we will have the 88 election. Um, early on, looks like Michael Dukakis is going to win. George W. Bush has always seemed to be in the shadow, or H.W. Bush is in the shadow of Reagan. But later on, this is where um, an AP government study in depth a lot about this campaign. But this is where, where the Bush campaign will ultimately win. Um, we will have in May of 1989 the Tiananmen Square in China. This will be you said, the famous um, student that stops the row of the of the of the tanks. And this is where we'll have some major changes. And even though the communist government will stay in charge in there, um, China itself will become a lot more capitalistic in its economic side of that. And what you think of China today started in 1989. We're going to have the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989 um, in here. Reagan's given credit. The glass loss idea is a, a major thing that happens um, in here. And this is why I have this question. How did Levi's and Pepsi help win the Cold War? Well, what ended up happening is these communist areas, they were seeing and seeing with America and how rich we were. And they wanted Pepsi. They wanted to have Levi's. They wanted to have Kentucky Fried Chicken and McDonald's on um, there. And capitalism was just so much of a lure um, that they have on um, there. People that lived in East Germany, one of them, one of the biggest things sold in the black market were Levi jeans because that's what you wanted. And for somehow or another, you could get a Cadillac snuck into a country for communist country. Oh my goodness, um, there that was one of the biggest things. And so yes, we do have um, Reagan and where we have the Star Wars and we have the long-term plan of containment. But ultimately, where capitalism wins because well, we want stuff. All right, people want stuff. We don't want to be all the same. Again, communism on paper sounds really good. Everybody's equal um, there, but when it's in reality, um, it wasn't. It wasn't what people wanted um, that, that they have, and that's ultimately what wins. And so that's why when you see a statement, we win by Levi's and Pepsi's um, in here. Yeah, the 1980s with the big hair um, there. How many of your moms look that way? Uh, this one. This is where we will have the 1980s. Will also be the rise of the personal computer. Uh, there. Look at the price of that. You see that's just under $6,000 uh, there. And that's pretty expensive and you think, all right, I could buy a laptop for a tenth of that. Yes, you could. And in today's money also, that would be closer to probably about $20,000 for that. So it was really expensive for a computer. Um, they get a lot cheaper um, with what you have in that.